It's great to welcome back to the program Catherine Stewart, who's the author of The Power Worshippers Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. Uh, Catherine, so great to have you back. It's wonderful to see you again. Thank you. So I think that now, partially thanks to this Netflix series, The Family, there are more people who are becoming familiar with the under the radar way in which Christian nationalism is a thing here in the United States, despite sort of at least nominally the separation of church and state. And one of the things a lot of people may not understand is all of the different sort of centers of power and influence that that are playing a role here. So can you kind of lay out the landscape for us a little bit? Sure. The you know, political movements are pretty complicated. And this one is, I think, more complex than most. Most it's kind of centerless. It consists of a variety of for profit and nonprofit organizations, legal advocacy groups, right wing policy groups, data initiatives media and messaging workshops, um, legislative initiatives. Um, so, you know, the movement's leaders are, there are a number of them. Uh, they're often interconnected through some of these initiatives, but uh, it's, it, it's a really vast uh, kind of movement with a lot of different components. And it shows the extent to which this, uh, uh, the Christian right has organized over decades, really in building this kind of infrastructure. Can you give a couple of the examples that might be more surprising to people of where what what some of the components are? Sure. I mean, let's start with the a legislative initiative called Project Blitz. It's uh, it operates a little bit like the American Legislative Exchange Council, if you know what that is. They craft uh, centrally craft legislation, and then these different pieces of identical or near identical legislation. Or they flood the states, all of them in, in, intending to sort of chip away bit by bit at the separation of church and state in different ways. So, for instance, um, this past uh, year and a half, uh, in dozens of states have seen these In God We Trust bills, which mandate that people put large In God We Trust signs in public school classrooms, in public schools, even on you know, public buildings, even on the windows of police cars, just to sort of get the idea in people's minds, you know, in God we trust. This is somehow, you know, unifying the idea of religion with the national identity. But, you know, when they, these in God we trust bills come into a state, people think it's sort of a one-off and maybe they oppose it or maybe they don't. But the fact is these are pieces, uh, pieces of legislation that are crafted by Project Blitz. And so that, in that's God interesting. We trust. One thing I'm mm -hmm. thinking of is when, when uh, bans on same-sex marriage were effectively outlawed by the Supreme Supreme Court in June of 2015, we we talked at the time about how the battle lines against LGBT rights were going to shift from marriage to workplace discrimination, so-called religious freedom, and then a whole bunch of different instances of this popped up at the state level. Was that also an example of the way in which this is this is crafted and then kind of rolled out nationally? Absolutely. I mean, the the uh, architects of Project Blitz have arranged this type of legislation into three categories. The first is more, uh, you know, you could call it um, symbolic. But the third category is really about a uh, license to discriminate against people whose uh, so called lifestyles are very being. Uh, that they disapprove of. So uh, a, a opposition to LGBT equality uh, is on the front lines of that third category. When we talk about this concept of the culture war, religiosity seems to be a big part of that. I mean, very often when we talk about like the more religious and older Fox News demographic and how it ties into very often supporting Republican agenda rather than Democratic agenda. Can you talk a little bit about how you think of the, the concept of culture war in this concept context of religiosity? Sure. I mean, I think we're kidding ourselves if we just look at this through a culture war framework. Um, the uh, this is a political movement, and it's all about power. And mm. if you look at the um, expansiveness of the positions of the leaders, look when they're talking to the the you know the voters, and when they're talking to pastors about how to talk to their congregants about these issues to turn them out to vote. 
there, it's all abortion all the time, or it's some of these other same, uh, you know, same sex marriage or uh, these other kinds of culture war issues. But when you look at what they say in the forms that they share, or when they're talking to sympathetic audiences, they have incredibly expansive policy proposals, economic policy, foreign policy, domestic policy. And that shows that this is a much more expansive movement. It's not just a culture war. I mean, if you can, they understand really well that if you can get people to vote on one or two issues, you can capture their vote. So that's why they've focused so heavily on these on these particular issues. You know, in in the um, coronavirus situation that we're dealing with, we've seen a lot of prominent Christian televangelists preying on vulnerable people, on their disproportionately elderly audiences, uh, offering things like silver you can drink to cure coronavirus. Kenneth, <sighs> that's Jim Baker. Kenneth Copeland did a sort of pray away coronavirus thing with his hands covered in in I, I mean I'm guessing it's water but some some sort of holy liquid I'm sure is that that's a very cartoonish representation of the connection between news and religion does that have any connection to the to the movement you're talking about which is working legislatively etc or are these really two totally different things and no it's all connected look the movement is deeply hostile it's very anti science mm. they uh, you know obviously are anti evolution uh, very uh, take very strong uh, most segments of the movement take very strong anti environmental um, uh, policies because that's sort of part of their policy it's a very sort of pro business you know business friendly a uh, 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 movement um, because they depend critically on the wealth of a subsection of America's plutocratic class. Um, so they do take anti-environmental policies. They take an, um, anti-science uh, policies, and they and they disparage critical thinking above all. And so that movement has really kind of taken control of the Republican Party. And I think you see the consequences in the administration's reaction to the coronavirus and a pandemic like this, where we're unable to sort of, there's a kind of diminishment of value of expertise. You know, the people who are around uh, in Trump's inner circle, they're not chosen because they're experts in their field. They're chosen because they adhere to an extremist ideology and because they've uh, demonstrated like severe political, like extreme political loyalty. So Can you talk a little bit about you mentioned that political divide, right? Republicans and Democrats. Right. On the one hand, there's no question that in the electorate, this is far more prevalent on the right than on the left. At the same time, things like the national prayer breakfast and, you know, prayer from from a, a, a chaplain before the House starts. This stuff is basically codified and not really questioned very much by Republicans or Democrats. So can you talk a little bit about where there is a partisan divide on this and then where there is not? Well, I think most Democrats uh, support the separation of church and state and understand that it's not just a uh, sort of a technicality in our constitution and it's not just something for atheists. It's a principle that served our country very well since our nation's founding. Um, the kind of respect for religious pluralism. America is irreducibly pluralistic. And I think that um, that's uh, become a kind of partisan issue, respect for pluralism or the desire to impose uh, sort of single improved, uh, approved varieties of religion on the on the rest of us and to create within America a kind of hierarchy, a hierarchy of rights. At, at the same time, though, again, we, we see that there are these elements, you know, everything from um, the, the prayer before uh, the House comes to order and the national prayer breakfast, where the lines seem more blurred in terms of that separation. I'm, I'm wondering whether the movements you talk about are they specifically targeting Republicans or are they simply having sort of more success with them? How, how does that work? That movement has really seized control of the Republican Party. Let's just look at the issues like abortion. When Roe v. Wade was passed, most Republicans uh, supported it. Most Republican Protestants supported it. And there were uh, Republican pro-choice organizations up into the 90s or early 2000s. But bit by bit, they were purged because that sort of extreme wing seized control of the party. They knew that it was like easier in a way to uh, unite a, a smaller group around a radical core than it is to unite more disparate group of, of folks and create a, you know, a, a cohesion there. Um, I mean, look, 
it's absolutely true that religion, there's always been religion in our country. Freedom of religion is one of our founding principles and freedom of conscience. Um, and it's worth noting, I think, that there's a very strong progressive religious movement in America that rejects the politics of conquest and division that this movement represents. What are the other issues? I mean, it's obvious that abortion and gay marriage have recently been been very, very prominent. You sort of alluded to religious messages in civil society, in God we trust uh, everywhere mm -hmm. from currency, Pledge of Allegiance, et cetera. What are some of the other policy issues that this movement is concerned with and pushing for? Well, they're always talking about religious freedom of religious liberty, and it's a kind of specious idea of freedom that the religious freedom is your is the right of people with the so-called correct views, supposedly correct views, to discriminate against others. Um, but I think the calls for religious freedom are as loud and insistent as they are, not just because people with the correct views want the right to discriminate against others and to destroy basically you know various forms of equal rights and civil rights legislation, but also because they're really desperate to secure their tax subsidies mm. and to expand access to public money. So let's think about it this way. Religious organizations already enjoy substantial tax privileges and benefits and subsidies that other religious, uh, uh, non-religious nonprofits do not enjoy. They have parsonage exemptions. They don't have to open their books so the taxpayer can see where the money goes once, uh, you know, when they have it. So, um, so they get all these uh, exemptions and subsidies, and yet they're still eager to uh, seize a greater share of public money. So this is really obvious. I'll just give you one example, the field of public education. America spends something like, I don't know, $600 billion every year in public K through 12. The movement is really desperate to see, seize an even greater portion of that than they already have through vouchers. So, um, there, you know, there are already voucher programs throughout many states. I'm thinking like of state of Florida, where 80 percent of the voucher money flows into religious schools, which are free to discriminate uh, against LGBT students and teachers. They are free to uh, promote uh, creationism and uh, to teach kind of contempt for other forms of religion. Some of them teach a kind of Christian nationalist version of American history. So there's, um, uh, but they, they just want to seize more, more and more money. And now there's a case in front of the Supreme Court. Um, I think it's uh, called, uh, it's, uh, it, it took place in Montana. I can't, the name escapes me right now. Um, but um, it's another case where uh, uh, observers are, are noting that this may open the floodgates to even more tax funding, funding for religious organizations. So you write about like a three phase agenda and you, you talked at phase one is stuff like in God we trust on bills and on police cars, et cetera. Is, well, this is just for Project Blitz itself. That's not for the movement overall. Got it. Project Blitz is only one small of a much larger, uh, a much larger uh, kind well, of Well, even better than so, I mean, give us a uh -huh. sense of what is the broader Plan. So, you know, the, at the micro, we're talking about this in God we trust type stuff. It right, seems more course. macro is, for sure. example, getting getting of state money for schooling that can discriminate on religious grounds. What's the big picture? Well, it's a nationalist, authoritarian, anti-democratic movement. And I think that's kind of the bigger picture here is that this is a movement that uh, tries to, is trying to bring about a different kind of order. They don't I think a lot of people think of the religious right and they think, well, they just kind of want to see the table and they want, you know, in the form of noisy form of American democracy, they just want to have their voices heard and be taken into account. But this is an, a movement that really doesn't believe in, you know, modern pluralistic democracy with equal rights for all. They really want to establish a more authoritarian form of power. So let's look at it. We can compare it to other forms of religious nationalism around the world. When you look at what uh, Vladimir Putin is doing in Russia or Orban in Hungary or Erdogan in Turkey. When these leaders bind themselves closely to conservative religious authorities in their own countries in order to establish a more authoritarian form of power, we rightly recognize this as a form of religious nationalism. And I think that this is what we're seeing today with Trump's uh, alliance with our own religious hyperconservatives. Yeah, that in the limited time we have left, I wanted to ask, you know, Trump was has not been known to be a religious person for basically his entire life. All of a sudden, the Bible's his favorite book and so on and so forth. How much is Trump uh, sort of controlled by this? He's controlled by completely because he's dependent on them for 
his power. I mean, mm. they've managed to get a lock on a block of voters, and without their support, he would have failed. And I think when you look at his alliance with them, a lot of people think it's transactional. They think he's just going to appoint justices favorable to their interests or uh, economic policies favorable to their pocketbooks. But I think it goes further than that. I mean, Trump uh, sort of personifies a certain kind of authoritarian power that um, the move, the lead, that you know, religious nationalism often favors. Religious nationalism doesn't want a nice leader; they want a leader who's going to sort of break the rules and and knock heads, as long as those heads belong to their their so-called enemies. Yes, and and we're seeing that uh, weekly, if not daily, with uh, with with this administration. We've been speaking with Catherine Stewart. The book is "The Power Worshippers: Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism." Catherine, such a pleasure having you back on. Thanks so much for having me.